During my travels in Palestine, I drove extensively within Israel's borders. What I saw was a seemingly endless expanse of empty land, more than enough space to build new Israeli settlements. But the rush to build thousands of new housing units for Israelis is instead taking place in areas the Israeli government itself designated for a Palestinian state. Because of this, every one of these settlements is illegal under international law. In fact, there's such an outrageous violation of human rights that even Israel's closest ally and sponsor had to issue a public condemnation in early October. But the new settlement project was just the latest in a long list in 2016. In the months prior, the Israeli government had already revealed its plans to build nearly 800 illegal units across the West Bank, then announced an additional 323, then over 200 more. The latest 300 announced in October shows this expansion is going full speed ahead with total disregard for internationally agreed upon human rights. But this practice doesn't just mean expanding into Palestinian land. True to Israel's entire history, it's a story of moving in where people already live and kicking them out. Wherever these new settlements are planted, they first evict the Palestinians living there and bulldoze their homes into the ground. In the past 10 years, the Israeli government has seized and demolished over 1,100 Palestinian homes in the West Bank, leaving over 5,000 people homeless, half of them children. Enjoying total impunity with the protection of the U.S. Empire, Israel's home demolitions in the West Bank have hit a 10-year high. Over 200 homes have been demolished in 2016 alone, leaving 800 people homeless, 400 of them children. Many hundreds more have orders to evacuate their homes and businesses for demolition. I saw one Palestinian shop that was bulldozed by the Israeli military just the day before. Every home and business in this village is slotted for the same fate. Adding to the cruelty of this practice is how home demolition orders are actually issued to residents. Kasai, an expert who works to delay home demolitions, explains. The issuance, uh, issuing the demolition order goes through the ICA and the Israeli court system. However, this is not the interesting part about it. It's the way they're handed over to people. So when you say, it's like, it's not like subpoenas, for example, speaking to American crowds, you know, subpoenas have to be handed to a person and they have to state their name, saying, yes, it is me, and here, you hear why I've been served. When it comes to demolition orders or stop working orders or evacuation orders, they don't have to do that. What they do is, and this is mostly the case, like actually handing it to someone is a rare happening. What they do is, they just simply place it somewhere on the street, on a wall, on a balcony, whatever, and they would put just a rock on it, if they're courteous enough, so that the wind wouldn't blow it away. And then they would come, like, ten days after, and start demolition. So the people would say, hey, we were not given a heads up. No, we did. We, we gave you a heads up. We gave you a support order or a demolition order. But they never got it, because it was placed in a place where it's practically impossible for the owner of the land or the property to find out about it. What is the process to delay demolitions and how successful is that? Now, the legal way of handling it, and this is what's being done by many legal organizations aiding the farmers and the residents, is the moment you receive a demolition order or a stop working order, you immediately start with the process of the licensing. So while that is happening, by law the Israelis cannot demolish until there is a sentence in a court. And we keep on going with uh, appeal after appeal after appeal to stretch the periods until the demolition actually takes place. Now, this is the only resort we have, it's just stalling in courts, like trying to use the Israeli system against itself. But in the end, no matter how much we stall, the structure is going to be demolished. Now, if you're lucky, you're talking about something small. But most of the cases, you're talking about a home, not a house, a home where people live, families just on the street. Villages all across the West Bank have new settlements encroaching on their residents. Instead of building in the acres of empty land, they move in right next door and expand into Palestinian neighborhoods. This is a 
Again, these settlements are illegal because they are in the areas that Israel itself has agreed to for Palestine, which it claimed could be a future Palestinian state. We showed you how war and colonization reduced Palestine mainly to the shrinking West Bank. But inside this area lies another story. A mass uprising against Israel's brutal occupation led to a peace agreement in 1993 known as the Oslo Accords. But the supposed path to a two-state solution instead entrenched Israeli occupation and expansion. As part of the Oslo Agreement, the Israeli government insisted Palestine's West Bank be divided into three separate areas of control. Area A, Area B, and Area C. Area A is the only area where Palestinians have any sort of sovereignty. Area A means it is under civil and security control by the Palestinian Authority, or PA, widely considered a mere proxy occupation that closely collaborates with Israeli forces. These small islands of territory are less than 18% of the West Bank. Most Palestinians must move between these pockets to get to work, school, see family, a doctor, and everything else people do. This means passing through long, dangerous military checkpoints, where they are often harassed and brutalized. Leaving Area A brings them into Area B, which is 22% of the West Bank. Area B means the PA has control of civil society, but security by Israel. This means total occupation by the Israeli military, with non-stop, random checkpoints. This is where the settlements in question are being built, in Area B, as opposed to Area C, which is most of the West Bank, around 60%, containing the vast majority of the West Bank's resources, including water. Area C means it is under total Israeli control. 99% of it has been formally seized by the Israeli government. Israeli soldiers and towers are everywhere. Over 350,000 Israeli settlers have already moved in. Most of the demolitions in like uh, a reasonable world should be in Area C because this is where the Israelis have the administrative order over licensing. But recently we've been hearing a lot about demolition orders being conducted in Area B which is not only illegal, but outrageous, because they don't have the authority to do that there. Not that that has stopped the Israelis before, like legalities, but it's still a shocking thing that has been in the picture right now. Here's how it works. A Jewish settler from anywhere in the world, many of whom are born and raised in the United States, can plant a trailer home onto Palestinian land. They often choose the top of a hill overlooking a Palestinian village. Though illegal under Israeli law, the Israeli government will hook that new camp up with electricity, run pipes for water, and build settler-only roads for them to travel. The Israeli military also deploys soldiers and sets up a military outpost for so-called security. To kick out the Palestinians who live there, the settlers carry out acts of harassment and outright terrorism. The Israeli military not only protects the settlers, but also carries out their own attacks on the village and serve the official demolition orders. The Palestinian villages are raised, and the settlement grows into a fortified, walled-off monstrosity. Signs marking the settlements in Palestinian territory bear the ominous image of a howling wolf at their gates. The Palestinians have very little legal recourse. It's a practice. It's a systematic punishment system. The moment you, we have many um, stories about people who have, for example, settler attacks at their homes, and they go complain to the Israeli police because they're Area C. So, as a punishment for them, for complaining, now many of their rights are taken away from them. For example, you have people who live in Area C and, uh, or even Area B, but uh, filed a complaint and they're in their 60s. So by Israeli regulations, they're allowed to enter Jerusalem without any kind of permits, knowing that Jerusalem is actually in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. So many of them sur surprised to see that when they try to cross, they tell them, no, you, there's a standing lawsuit against you or you're involved, let's say, you're involved in a lawsuit, so you're not allowed to go to pass until the issue is resolved. And we know that the issue is never resolved because it's always against an unknown, against an anonymous uh, perpetrator. So it's a permanent punishment, making him an example for anyone else. Like if you want to complain, not only nothing will happen, something bad is going to happen. Even though it's them filing the complaint against someone yeah, who's it's, it's, attacking them. It's, it's a relative that uh, it's you are the oppressed or the oppressor, or you're the complainee or the, someone complaining against you. Your name is involved in a legal action, so you cannot move, you cannot... Uh, and there's also like other ways they do it, like for example, you're head of a family 
and you file a complaint against uh, an, a, like an attack from settlers or uh, an unlawful demolition order or etc. Anything else within those lines. Not only that they would punish you, they would punish your family. Let's say your kids have permits to go and work inside the occupied territories. Those permits will now be revoked. So it's not just punishing the person, but his entire family and making it clear as an example for other people, do not attempt to do what this person or this family did. Because mm -hmm. uh, one of the most shocking things to me being here is seeing not only the illegal settlements, of course, that we all know about, but the illegal outposts that are actually illegal under Israeli law, not just international law. Can you talk about what these are, how the government helps aid and abet them? As a Palestinian, I can tell you all, settler, like all settlements are illegal. Mm -hmm. They're established in the West Bank. And this is supposed to be the future Palestinian state. So any expansion and change in the demography, that's illegal. Now, when you're talking about illegal outposts that are even illegal by the Israeli standards, let's say there is this huge settlement, let's say Bracha, okay? Uh, a few settlers would move to the next hilltop and set up a caravan. And that caravan becomes two. And then those settlers need protection. So a military outpost is built right next to it. And that becomes a seed for a new settlement that's going to take that entire hilltop. Give it a couple of years, and that becomes a legal settlement. With, and notice that even those are illegal, somehow they manage to get power cables stretched for them from the main settlement that they emerged from. Water lines, roads are being opened for them. After years of operating illegally, even under Israeli law, many of these settlements are rewarded. Over one-third of these unauthorized settlements have been retroactively legalized under Israeli law. One Israeli settlement researcher described, we see it as a very gradual move toward annexation. Annexation means absorbing West Bank settlements into Israeli borders, dispelling the claim that Israel desires coexistence with an ever-shrinking Palestinian state. One of the hotbeds of expansion and settler violence against Palestinians is in the town of Kusra, which is split between areas B and C, and has already lost half of its land to settlements. Settlers have damaged or burned hundreds of olive trees, killed dozens of sheep, torched cars, and have set fire to a mosque in dozens of attacks over the years. Ibrahim Wadi has been the mayor of Kusra for more than six years. I spoke to him in his office about the continued assaults against his village, flanked by a developed settlement on one side, and a growing outpost on the other. Kusra is surrounded by Majdalun settlement, which is also the main entry into the town. In the south are also settlement outposts, such as Esh Kodesh, Kida, Abed Al Al, Shino, and Shibat Rahim. In the past six years, Kusra was subjected to several attacks, most of which were from this outpost to the south, which is Esh Kodesh. The settlers from Esh Kodesh burned the Al Nurian Mosque of Kusra. They burned many vehicles in the eastern area. They also would kill the farmer's sons in the town. There are lots of farms with olive trees, which they destroyed, as we see on this map. We also notice in this image, they destroyed more than 2,728 olive trees in the past six years. Kustra used to live as a stable rural setting, far away from settlement issues and the violence of settlers. But in the past six years, settler violence has intensified, which has led to the deterioration of our economic condition and the psychological condition of children in the town. The settlers are groups who are outside the law. In the partition of our town, it was partly in area B and partly in area C. We note that parts of these lands occupied by the settlers are in area B. These lands are supposed to be under absolute Palestinian control. This is indicative of the double standards of Israeli law and also the Israeli police. They chase after the farmers and distribute evacuation orders, such as this order on this farm, the chief inspector pursues the people on the premise that they are in Area C, under Israeli control. But this is Area B, which is under Palestinian control. In the town of Kusra, we are now living in a state of chaos, outside the law, outside human rights and the rights of man. Majdalene settlement has been in the town of Kusra since 1971. This settlement, according to the classifications and known criteria, is a legal settlement. But in the past few days, it has started expanding into Palestinian land along with the expropriation of many assets to expand the settlement. At the same time, they keep us from entering our farmlands, which are near the settlement. The attacks on Palestinians also target one of their major sources of income, olive trees. The olive tree is not only a symbol of Palestinian life and culture, but families also depend on olives for their livelihood. 
Over 30% of their olive trees are behind Israeli security fences. And in the past 40 years, over a million olive trees have been destroyed in Palestinian lands. The olives in this land have been there from before the occupation. How are we to get to it? It poses a danger to the citizen's life to leave Kusra, to come to this land near Esh Kodesh. He needs to be protected from the settlers' attacks. In addition, the Israelis determine the work hours for our harvesting work. It is not allowed to start before 9 in the morning and continue after 4 in the afternoon. With us, harvesting the olives starts at 7 a.m. and ends at 7 p.m., so this presents us with a problem. They give us only six days in the year, three days to plow the land and three days to pick the olives. This also affects our economic condition because it is not enough time for the farmer to pick the fruit and also to trim and take care of the trees. From this policy, the area becomes barren land. And according to the Ottoman Empire law, revised in 1982, if land is considered barren for five years, it becomes property of the state. That means that it becomes Israeli controlled and expands the settlements. Of course, we have houses in the southern area near Esh Kodesh. They attacked this house more than once. They tried to chase this farmer from his house by attacking him, smashing his windows, and continuously beating him. Palestinians are not allowed to expand. Palestinians are not allowed to build. There are rules over the Palestinian lands to benefit the settlers in their expansion. We are here in the southern part of Kusra's village. This village continuously suffers from confrontations and attacks by Israeli settlers from the outpost of Vaish Kodesh. As I mentioned, this outpost represents a constant threat to the southern part of the village, the houses, the public park, as well as the agricultural areas. The goal of these attacks is to control the fertile farmlands. The Israeli settlers from the outpost of Vaish Kodesh illegally occupied these hills in the southern part of the village. In the beginning, the outpost was established at the main entrance of Kusra in 1981, which was small and inside of a fence. Since then, it has expanded into Palestinian farms, including the crops and fields around it. In accordance with the Oslo Accords, the Kusra village should have been provided protection. But since the Palestinian National Authority has limited authority, we have had to form youth protection committees ourselves. The settlers burned the mosque, which is located in the neighborhood behind us, many vehicles and houses. Many of the farmers' children left their parents' homes because they couldn't tolerate the random, inhumane attacks. We all need to be humane, whether Palestinian or Israeli. We all should respect each other and our neighbor. Currently, thousands of acres, including wheat farms and olive trees, have been seized by the settlers of Aish Kodesh. During the past 14 years, we have been able to harvest the olive trees only one time. The settlers don't allow us access to the olive trees and keep us away with weapons. These are real facts and this is our land. We have history and rights here. The farmers can smell the scent of their ancestors in the soil. We are staying here and we are not going anywhere. According to a recent UN report, Israeli settler attacks on Palestinians have quadrupled in the past decade. Khalid's is the last house remaining in Area B in the town of Burim. When a settlement trailer appeared on the hilltop above his home, his family began to be attacked.
فالاعتداءات هاي المتكررة دائما تكون بشكل وحشي حاولوا مرة أكثر من مرة إنه يحرقوا البيت وحركوا مرة سيارة ودائما باستمرار برموا الحجار و بكسروا أي إشي عم يعني بحاول إنه قابل الكسر راح ينكسر وعد عن ذلك إذا كان مثلا عندنا أولاد صغار يعني أطفال أي إشي هذا أكيد راح يسبب لهم مثلا حالة نفسية أو خوف باستمرار ف شو كمان ممكن أحكي؟ Can you tell me more about how you were physically attacked by settlers؟ دائما هلا في حال إنه إنه هجموا علينا المستوطنين إنه أنا عندي هون أبوي وأمي كانوا الواحد راح يكون أكيد يخاف عليهم ف أبوي وأمي كبار في السن وسنين فأنا اللي راح يعني أطلع مثلا وفي حال هجموا أنا اللي راح أطلع أواجههم وأكيد راح يصير مو علي حجار و... إلا ما يكون في إصابات مثلا أنت لما تواجه عشر عشرين مستوطن كلهم بيرموا حجار عليك إلا أكيد إنه راح يصيبك إشي منهم And talk about what this outpost is and how the government's protecting it المستوطنين بس ينزلوا أو يحاولوا يهجموا طبعا إنه الجيش أو الجيش الإسرائيلي إنه بدعي إنه مش بإيدهم بس في حال إنه هجموا المستوطنين علينا بيجوا الجيش لما يجوا الجيش الإسرائيلي بتشجعوا أكثر وبصير إنه الجيش الإسرائيلي بح يعني بحميهم يعني في حال أنت ضربت مستوطن أو دافعت وضربت على المستوطنين حجار راح الجيش الإسرائيلي يساند المستوطنين ويقوم بضرب إذا اضطروا إنه مثلا يطخوا أو يرموا مسيلات الدموع والصوتيات راح يأذونا بس هم يعني بتشجعوا أكثر في إنه يهجموا بزيادة في حال إنه كان من الجيش الإسرائيلي موجود حسب الأوضاع اللي بتكون موجودة في فلسطين بشكل عام بيأثر على علينا وعلى اعتداءات المستوطنين علينا يعني بالأخير بيت الواحد مستحيل لو على رواحنا إنه ما بنترك البيت يعني نحن خلص بنستنى مثلا الفرج من رب العالمين إنه راح نضل هون أكيد يعني مش راح نترك البيت وإحنا هون إن شاء الله للأبد يعني يعني حتى الله يأخذ أمانته يعني. This inhumane crisis of evictions and demolitions is led by the religious extremist settler movement. True to Israel's entire history, this movement is carrying out the same project of total conquest of Palestine and expulsion of its indigenous inhabitants, no matter the cost. All of this is being done under the claim that settlers are acting in self-defense from the so-called terrorists that want to kill them. But only one side in this fight has a license to kill and will commit nothing short of unspeakable horrors to ensure their takeover continues. And as I saw myself, no one, even the most innocent, is safe. احنا بين احتلالين احتلال المخ احتلال البلاد وفي الشك انه طريق الى المساواه معقد بس مستقبلنا بدي